Good evening. You guys feeling hot or I'm alone? I want to make a judgment, you know, whether I'm sick or <laughs> I was warmed by the presence of the Lord. <laughs> it's wonderful to have you guys here this evening. Wonderful time to go through God's word as he has commanded us. If you're joining us for the first time, this is Calvary Chapel, and this is our midweek Bible study. We go through the Bible, book by book, and chapter by chapter, and verse by verse, as the Lord gives us strength to do so. Today we'll be in the book of Micah the prophet, if you have your Bibles. Chapter 6, we kind of go, we're going to do a topical teaching tonight, just a few verses of uh, chapter 6, and see what the Lord has for us this night. I will read if you're there. I'll begin from verses 8 and then we'll back up. He has shown you, O men, what is good and what does the Lord require of you, but to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. Verses 1. Hear now what the Lord says. Arise, plead your case before the mountains, and let the hills hear your voice. Hear, O you mountains, the Lord's complain, and you strong foundations of the earth. For the Lord has a complaint against his people and he will contend with Israel. O oh, my people, what have I done to you? And how have I worried you? Testify against me, for I brought you up from the land of Egypt. I redeemed you from the house of bondage. And I sent before you Moses, Aaron, and Miriam. O oh, my people, remember now what Bala, king of Moab, counseled. And what Balaam, the son of Boer, answered him. From Acacia Grove to Gilgal, that you may know the righteousness of the Lord. With that... Shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before the high God? Shall I come before him with the burnt offerings, with cows a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, 10,000 rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body, for the sin of my soul. He has shown you, O oh man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? But to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with the Lord your God. 
I think and I believe many times we, we have a lot of lingering questions in our minds. We want to ask questions, you know, why am I here? Why did God really create me? What is my purpose for this life? Why am I present in Eldoret today, right now? Why am I doing this job? Why did the Lord call me to do this and that? We have a lot of many questions. We can't even state all of them. But what we encounter from this prophet and this conversation that God is bringing out towards his people, what the Lord is speaking to a people that he called to himself. If you read the book, you'll see there are a lot of judgment that is passed towards the house of Judah, the house of Israel, how people just turn their, their eyes from the Lord every time. And the Lord will always be gracious to remind us of what he has done for us. The basis of what we're going to talk about tonight is what does the Lord requires of you as a person? Do you know it? Maybe you know, maybe you don't. But thankfully to God we have his word and we are going to follow through and see what God really wants us to pay attention to. As it begins here in verses 1, it says, hear now what the Lord says. It's sort of a, a dialogue between God and the people of God. He speaks convictingly to the people that he called to himself. He knows that these people have indulged in sin. But in this dialogue, he wants to call the people to righteousness and to right judgment. And perhaps the people should be convicted of the conditions of their hearts and how they have gone away from the Almighty God. Hear now what the Lord says. Arise and plead your case before the mountains and let the hills hear your voice. Hear all mountains. You know, sometimes we speak and we, we, we don't want... If you want it to be a secret, they say, you want to whisper to your friend, you want to be careful with the walls because they say that even the walls have ears, right? <laughs> the, the, the mountains will hear you, even the wind. As they blow around, they carry what you have said. So people tend to be careful with what they want to say. Even when they know that there is craftiness in what they want to talk about. They just want to hide it. How not thoughtful of us to think about the presence of God in all these suggestions that we give to our minds. The fear of the Lord is to acknowledge the presence of God. So if we don't fear the Lord, we will not acknowledge his presence in the things we want to talk about in our action, every aspect of our lives. We won't pay attention to what God requires of us. The hearts of these people were not consistent with what they did. They disobeyed a holy God had done things that grieved 
the heart of God. And now the Lord is calling them for a dialogue. Now think about it. The Lord our King, who knows the condition of our hearts, who knows that we have gone astray, who knows our wayward hearts, still calls us in this very state that we are in. Say, hear, all you mountains, the Lord's complain. Hear what the Lord is complaining about. Is he right to complain about something? (laughs) Is he right to call you for a committee, you and him? (laughs) You know, don't we like committees, right? (laughs) You know, we, 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 we want to do something here like, let's bring a committee. And let's bring a committee. We have committees everywhere. <laughs> we have a committee to spearhead over the committee that is supposed to be formed. <laughs> and these things, they take away even from the, the, the government because, you know, we just want to, the, the government wants to help this group of people. They have to form a committee to do it. <laughs> Kenyans love it. But here the Lord is calling us heart to heart. He wants us to be reminded. You know, when the, the, the Lord, when, when Isaiah appeared before the Lord and he spoke to him, what did he say? Woe unto me. Woe unto me. Because he looked at the glory of the Lord via the condition of his heart. He said, I'm not worthy to come before the presence of the Holy God. You know, sometimes people would say, man, I was in the presence of God and these things happened. It is wonderful that in the presence of God, Things happen, good things will happen. But the closer you come to the presence of God, the more you realize how needy you are of Him, that you need Him more and more. If you come out of the presence of God with pride, maybe you didn't even go to the presence of God. Maybe you weren't even there. Because we go there and we are broken at the feet of our Lord. Oh my people, what have I done to thee? I pray that we, as we read these words, we think about the heart of God. You know, when, when someone comes to you, whatever issue it is, and he says, hey, what have I done to you? <laughs> what have I done? You probably you would begin to explain a little bit about the situation, right? You want them to be acquainted with what is going on. What have I done to you? For me to receive this kind of judgment, for you to say this against me or for me, what have I done to you? And here the Lord say, Oh, my people, what have I done to thee? Here they are called to show why God should not pronounce sentence upon them. This is really astonishing. God appears to humble himself even to his creatures to ask this question. 
you have acted basely, treacherously, and ungratefully to me. These had already been proven by the prophet many times. The deeds, the acts of God's people, their conduct. He had said before that, hey, have I required a religious service from you? What have I required from you? You remember what he said to King Saul? I don't desire sacrifices. It doesn't matter what they are. Fat. I don't require them. All I wanted you to do was to obey me and to keep my laws, my commandments. Oh, my people, what have I done to you? And how have I worried you? Testify against me. I mean, how, how do you testify against God? Because some people have tried to do. When we go through hard situations, say, God, you did this for us. You took the people I love the most. You, I, I had this job, you have taken it away from me. I had this, now I don't. God, why have you done this for me? Have we questioned God before? Probably not one time. Many times. Why God? Why God? Why have you done this for me? And where do we even find the strength to testify against a holy God? This is what the Lord says. For I brought you are from the land of Egypt. I redeemed you from the house of bondage and I sent before you Moses, Aaron, and Miriam. Slavery was not an easy thing or being a slave was not something to be taken lightly. And something that was a torment to them something that really frustrated them. They cried to the Lord, and the Lord heard them. And here the Lord is reminding them, years later, how he brought them out of slavery. Where you were slaves and grievously oppressed from all these, I redeemed you. And in another sense, the Lord is saying, was this a small thing to you? Was it a small thing? I sent before thee Moses, my chosen servant, and instructed him that he might be your leader and a lawgiver. I sent him Aaron that he might be your priest and transact all the spiritual matters between myself and you. I also sent Miriam so that she might direct the females. She might instruct the ladies. In other words, I was mindful of you people as a nation, as a people. Was that a small thing to you? What is it? A small thing. Oh, my people, remember now what Balak, king of Moab, counseled. Remember now what King Balak of Moab Consulted. You remember what he did? Sent Balaam to curse your fathers. 
but my influence, I obligated him to do it the other way around. Instead of him cursing you, he blessed your forefathers. Was that a small thing to you? Was that a small thing? And from Shittim unto Gilgal. You're in the process of their movement from these two locations. At some point, they really forsook the Lord and they went to what the Lord called halotry. As it is recorded in Numbers 25. And Israel abode in Shittim, and there the people began to commit wordom with the daughters of Moab. They're on the way, the Lord is delivering them, the Lord is leading them, and they stood to a place, and they began to go against the commands of the Lord. And before they would cross to the Jordan, there will be a reference of a miracle of a passage over Jordan. That though they sinned greatly to the Lord, the Lord had mercy on them in these days. And also he provided a way for them to cross the river Jordan. And the Lord is saying, was that a small thing? Was that a small thing? You guys deserved death. But I didn't kill you. Why was the Lord doing all these things? That you may know my righteousness. That you may know how I deal with people. The way I deal with your forefathers the way I am dealing with you right now is not the way you deserve, but it is because of my justice, my mercy, and because I am God. that you may know the righteousness of the Lord. With that, shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before the high God? This is now the people of God. Shall I come before him with burnt offering, with cars, a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, 10,000 rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the first fruit of my body, for the sin of my soul? This is probably reasonable according to the law, but this will not be sufficient. And at some point, the things they're going to talk about are very absurd and impossible, and some of it even sinful, as they're thinking about it. (laughs) They're placing themselves in some corner that they can't even take themselves out. Because we have heard what the Lord has spoken. It is true indeed. Who can deny 
all these things, the things he's done for us over the ages. He's reminding us of all these things. Who are we to deny? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams? I mean, if they gather the whole nation, they probably will have thousands of them, right? They'll have them for sure. But the question is, is this sufficient? Is it sufficient? In their own nation, probably they are able to procure this. It might be difficult, but they can get it. But in their conscience, it says, neither these things will help us. We know. With 10,000 of rivers of oil? This is absurd and impossible. But even if they were able to procure all this, could this make an atonement for the guilt and ingratitude and the rebellion of these people? Could this work it out? Their thought process were amazing. Like, <laughs> we have rivers of oil. <laughs> Thousands of rivers. I mean, where do you get that kind of oil? <laughs> Which farm? Which machinery? I mean, how do you make it flow without stopping? This is oil. What is going to swim in this oil? <laughs> You know, these are the kind of things that we, we, we came about with when we are in sin and we can't figure out a way out. All we can think about is something that is, it is impossible. Very impossible. The fruit of my body for the sin of my soul. You know, they, in a way, they borrowed the culture from the nation surrounding them. The nation that used to sacrifice their children so that they would appease their gods. We see this even in, in 2 Kings 3, 26. From 26, it says here, and when the king of Moab saw that the battle was too sore for him, he took with him 700 men that drew swords to break through even to the king of Edom, but they could not. Then he took his eldest son that should have reigned in his state and offered him for a burnt offering upon the wall. And there was great indignation against Israel, and they departed from him and returned to their own land. You see the absurdity of humanity when we think, you know, we can shed human blood to help us, whether in war or we have offended the gods. This is what we can do. Maybe the animals are not sufficient. Let us offer human beings. And they thought about it. They thought about it. The fruit of my body for the sin of my soul. You know, when they had put all these questions to their reason and conscience, they found no satisfaction. 
In fact, their destruction increased and their despair was just right on their faces. They could not save themselves. What are you going to do? How are you going to save yourself? All the means that would be possible, humanly speaking, are impossible because we know how God deals with people. Maybe they remembered that God does not require sacrifices. He wants obedience. Then how do you fix obedience in trying to figure out how you will get a lot of oil, kill your firstborn, or slaughter thousands of rams? How would that atone for your sins, for your wrongdoings? But there's one thing that we know from the Lord, that as he is questioning these people, his own people, he's trying to jog their minds a little bit because these things are not news. You remember what God told them in Deuteronomy. In Deuteronomy, Chapter 10, verses 12. This is the decree of the Lord. Say, and now, Israel, what does the Lord your God require? of you. The same thing he's going to talk about here. But to fear the Lord, your God, to walk in his ways and to love him, to serve the Lord, your God, with all your heart and with all your soul and to keep the commandments of the Lord and his status, which I command you today. For your good. The Lord is commanding the children of Israel to do this. For whose good? For our own good. For if you're going to be just, you are going to enjoy the benefit of living justly with people. And this is not just, you know, thinking of justice in terms of what happens in our judicial courts. This is how you rightly judge matters around you with people that live closer to you. Justice at home. The way you approach issues that concern you with your, the people around you, you with your neighbor, you with your spouse, you with your local authority, you with that, that person that sometimes you don't even like. Are you behaving justly towards them? Justice. This is what the Lord requires. Say, He has shown you, O man, what is good. Already you know it. That is why they are trying to figure out things, but they can't. Because the standards of God in terms of righteousness and our standards. Totally different. He has shown you, O oh man, what is good and what does the Lord require of you. Friends, you know it. 
You know, when, when we began the book of Romans with our pastor, Josh, he mentioned to us, or he said to us, that humanity as we are, in of ourselves, we, are, we have the capacity to know the triune God even without the written word. We are able to know that what is to be known of God has been revealed to us. So that, Paul says, that no one will be without excuse. Saying, oh well, I was in Turkana, I never heard the gospel. No, you know it. <laughs> Even in deep in the bushes somewhere where People don't go, there's no Bible, there's no internet, there's no mobile phones. They're able to know God. And when God says that what is good has been shown to us, he's just trying to remind us what he's told us before. He's saying humbly that, hey, consider what I have told you before. Consider. If you don't consider, there are repercussions. You know, when, when you're being enrolled in a school or, you know, you're new in your workplace, they sometimes will write to you requirements, right? This is what you'll need when you come to our school. The, we'll need the Bible. What version? Revised standard version <laughs> for most schools I've seen. And a hymn book. By the way, come to think about it. Do we, did we even pay attention to these hymn books? <laughs> they were just for the sake of the school to get you in. These are the requirements. You have all of them. And when form ones are coming in, fresh as, they have all of them new, brand new. And you know who are watching you when you come in? The form trees. <laughs> These new ones. I'm going to have that one, that one, that one, that one. <laughs> Bullies. Were you guys bullied? No? <laughs> Did they tell you to write your family's name on a piece of grass? Did they tell you to col collect darkness in a basin and bring it to them? Your schools were nice. <laughs> we have all these requirements. If you don't fulfill them, the administration will have a problem with you. They say, no, you don't have one, two, three items. You stand here first. And so if you force your way in, you know what will happen when you're in there? You'll be trying to maybe peep on people's books, on the, whatever they have, or if you don't have a basin, you, you try to get them when they don't see you so that you'll use them because you don't have all the requirements. And you know, by that, you get comfortable not having your own, but you're getting comfortable trying to steal people's things to use them, right? When you don't have the requirements, whatever goes on in your mind is not clear most of the time. And the Lord is saying here, what is required of you? Three things. To do justly, number one. And number two, to love mercy. and to walk humbly with your God. Just check all those three things. To be just. Because even in our justice system, there is no justice. <laughs> There's no justice. People will get away with things they should have not gotten away with. People will pay money and they will get away with things. And we call it Justice, no. 
justice in the context of God, this is high standard. That as you're thinking of something else that is not godly, remember that he watches. So how do you want to deal with your neighbors? How do you want to deal with people around you? Do you remember that God is watching? He does. Or if you're not aware, friend, let me remind you, he watches. <laughs> and he knows if he's not, then he's not the God we're talking about. Because our God is omnipresent. He's all-powerful. He's everywhere. He knows it. In fact, even before your thought process, he knows what you're going to be thinking about. So ahead of time, he knows it. So that would be a good reminder for us to always search our hearts, as David says. Search my heart, O oh God. To love mercy. You know, many people, we love when people are merciful with us, but we don't want to show mercy to people. Do unto others what you would them do unto you. So for the people who love mercy, they are kind to people. They are tender-hearted. They are forgiving. Forgive one another. Even as God in Christ forgave you. Be tender-hearted towards one another. Thy heart. Your heart, your body, your soul, and your spirit, your wisdom, your understanding, your judgment. To love him with all your heart, your soul, and your mind, and strength, and your neighbor as yourself. This is what God requires from us, and it is right to do so to every man. It is right to do so, not to specific people that I'm in inclined to love. Do that to everyone. Is that easy? Love your neighbor as thyself. You know, when Jesus is saying these words, he, he wants us to think about something, especially ourselves. We are full of ourselves. We, we, we already have a problem that we love ourselves too much. So the question is, what measure do you give to your neighbors, considering how much you love yourself? What is the measure? The measure you'd love them to give you back, right? Friends, this is, it is not an easy thing to do. I was reading and thinking about it. I'm like, God, I, I probably don't want to talk about it because I know my heart. I struggle with these things every day. How do I love people with the proper perspective? I don't know about you. You are to give to your neighbor what is due. <laughs> and what is that? Something that you would wish something, someone to give back to you.
You want people to be nice to you. You're never nice to them. You want people to be kind to you. You're never kind to them. We, you, you always take things to your boss, even things that are very unreasonable. Okay, I heard them saying this. I heard him. I heard her. They say this. They say that. In all these hearsays, there is never justice system around it. When you hear people say, you know, I heard so-and-so saying, and you're coming to tell me what you heard someone saying, there are never facts about them. I'd rather have the people involved telling me what really happened. Then you'd have the right perspective. You guys perhaps have done this test, you know, putting a lot of people in a line, everyone facing that way and whispering a word to them. <laughs> By the time you're getting to the end, it is not the same thing. It's been murdered <laughs> in the middle of people talking and that, what did he say? Oh, this. That it, it, it's not that way with God's word. The same words he spoke to the forefathers of these people, he's speaking to them, and you know what? He's speaking these words to us today. That is how God's word is alive, speaking to us today. And when you're hearing these words, like maybe... Maybe this is not me. <laughs> if it's not you, I applaud you. But this is really me. I got to figure it out. Not with my own mind. I got to go to the Lord. I got to ask for wisdom from the Lord. I, I, I want to deal justly with the people around me. I want to be merciful. And I don't want to be prideful. The Lord has blessed you abundantly, maybe not with money, with speech that you can speak before people and gain their applause. Maybe you, whatever it is, and then slowly you begin to be very prideful, thinking, you know, even w without the Lord, you're able to do it. <laughs> Without the Lord, you're able to speak to people. It will not last. You might be able to do it, but it won't have a lasting result. You are to love mercy. Not only to do what justice required, but also what mercy, kindness, and benevolence, and charity requires. All these things. Be a just man and woman. Be merciful. Walk before the Lord with humility. Humility does not mean that you will not be upset with people and situations but how you respond to them. You know the Bible writes that apart from our Lord Jesus Christ, the, the, the man who was very humble was Moses. <laughs> Think about that. But we see instances when he's frustrated. God tells him to speak to the rock. He hits the rock. But still the Bible says he was who? The most humble man. David, the Bible writes that he was a man after God's own heart. Do you know how many things David did? Weird, <laughs> sinful. Our perspective, 
about things will really inform the people around us if, if we love them or we're just, we're just being accommodative. You know, there's a way you can just accommodate people. You don't like them anyways, but you just, whatever, we go to the same church anyways. <laughs> Be just. Walk humbly before God. This acknowledges, this is for us also to acknowledge our iniquity and to submit to the saving power of our Lord Jesus Christ. Where there is free mercy, he's already provided that for us. Would we find it in our heart to go to the throne of mercy where there is forgiveness. David say, I'd rather fall in the hands of God where there is mercy and forgiveness than in the hands of my enemy. Because my enemies will kill me. They will destroy me. But sometimes, you know what we do? We run towards that road the enemy's camp. Because we think, you know, ah, this, this, is, this is an easy thing to do. Just to be merciful to people, I can do that. <laughs> to be humble, yeah, I can. I can humble myself. <laughs> Sacrifice has been offered to us at the cross. The Lord, in his quest to talk to his people, he's not intending for them to be destroyed, but rather he's calling them back so that they can have a relationship with him. Oh, my people, hear what the Lord says. Hear the Lord. And... I want to repeat those same words to us here tonight. Hear what the Lord says. Maybe you have found yourself in a situation where you think maybe there is no forgiveness. Maybe there's no available mercy anymore. Maybe the way the Lord would deal with me, considering what I have done, is unthinkable. So this call would either drive you to the feet of Jesus or actually drive you away as you try to think on how you will atone for your sins by yourself. Is it by your, you know, your own children? By the amount of oil you can gather? Among, amount of animals you can gather? How do we enter his kingdom? Mercy and forgiveness as provided. Are you willing to come before the Lord and say, God, this is me. This is my situation. I'm stuck. I don't know how to get myself I did take myself in here. I don't know how to take myself out. The Lord is gracious. The Lord is faithful. He's done it for many people. He will do it for you. We have heard of his faithfulness. The reason why he's speaking to his people in this manner, I say that you may know the righteousness of the Lord. The one who is righteous is calling you to abandon every weight you might have so that you can come and receive mercy and forgiveness. Friends, for me that is a good news considering 
the condition of my heart, the things I have to battle every day, this is a good news for me. That is, there is grace and mercy and forgiveness available. Would we pray together? God, we are thrilled at how you, you deal with us. We are humbled to know that even in our state, in our helpless state, you still call unto us to think about the things you have done for our forefathers and even the things you have done for us before. To think about your righteousness, your holiness. And this is all you require from us, that we we'll fear you and do what is right. To be just before you. To love mercy, not just to speak about it, but to love mercy. And to be humble before you. To walk in humility. Maybe some of us are walking in uttermost arrogance. I pray that in your own way you speak to our hearts for you say you, you bring down the pride, the prideful and you lift those who are humble. Help us, Lord. Help our unbelief Help our hearts that are struggling to get your truth. Sometimes we, we get moved and we, we want to do your will for this one moment and then we go back to our former state and we just get used to the routine. How I pray that your Holy Spirit will be at work in us, Lord. I don't know about every one of us here tonight but I know that I need you. Every hour, every moment. That without you, Lord, every step I make, I make it in vain. I pray that you will lead us and guide us. I pray that as many as we are gathered and we are listening to your word tonight, the Holy Spirit, you will indwell us. Cause us to understand your word, that we will act upon it, that we will not just be hearers, but also be doers of your word. We bless you and we thank you as we go out in fellowship. We ask for your blessing upon us in Jesus' name. Amen. The Lord bless you, church. Thank you for joining us tonight. Have a wonderful evening and bon appetit for those who will eat.